Well, yeah, okay, that's great. Why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to uh, Healthcare Principles and Practice, and today we're talking about uh, analysis of adverse medical events, culture, and process, and tools. And speaking with me today, I'm Alan Court, the Assistant Dean for Faculty Development. And speaking with me today uh, will be Jackie Bishop. And Jackie's title is QI Director? QI Director, right. Medical Staff QI Director. And Paul Quinn, and Paul is Director of Patient Safety and Quality for the East Campus. Um, And these are the objectives for today that we're going to be walking through. Uh, I'm not going to read those to you. And what we're going to do uh, is actually take a look at a case that had an adverse event and then walk you through the process of how uh, we look at it and how we do the analysis. Now, some of you may have done this before, um, but it's always good to take the time to walk back through it and see how do we look at an adverse event and how do we determine what the root causes are. Um, if this were an actual patient, we would have you all sign a confidentiality agreement uh, before we actually start. Uh, in this case, uh, this is not an actual patient, although some of the parts of the case have been pulled from other cases. So before we get started, <clears throat> uh, could you raise your hands if you know what the quality goals are for the Erlanger Health System? Okay, so how many of you have either seen or been involved in a medical error? Hi, so don't be shy, okay. How many of you have participated in a disclosure to a patient or a family? Good, good. How many of you felt that you had adequate attending supervision when you disclosed that to the patient or family? Good, that's good. Right. How many of you put, have put an event into eSafe? Super, all right. And how many of you have received follow-up information about the event you put into eSafe. Okay. How many of you have actually gone to an RCA or an ACA? One? A couple back. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. Okay, great. So, um, how many of you know why we do an RCA? All right. All right. So um, what we're going to do today is look at reporting um, event investigation and then reporting in eSafe. One of the things I did want to take a few minutes to do as far as eSafe is concerned and tell you is that Anytime a resident puts something into eSafe, or if it's put in about you, or if you're involved in the event at all, that information will go to your program director. So after it goes into eSafe, then the information that has been entered will go into eSafe, that will go to your program director and they will know that you've either put one in 
or you've been involved in one um, in some way. And then they should be getting back to you. So if you have any questions about it, they can actually go in and see that eSafe in the system, which you cannot, but they can. Um, and the other thing is, um, let me just go back one here a second. Um, if it's a faculty member, they can um, put the event in and then they get notification that the event was entered. But one of the major complaints in the past has always been what? That you put something in and then you never got to see what happened with that. You never heard about it. So that's the reason that we really said the program directors now can actually give you feedback and they can go in and take a look. And the other thing that's happened that's a little bit different now is that instead of just knowing when it first goes in, there's also a status report. And Jackie, has that started now? So there should be a status update on every eSafe that you've put in so that you will know where it is in the system and what's going on with it. And then when that eSafe is finished and complete, the program director can then go back in again and tell you what the results, what the findings were on that eSafe and that investigation. Faculty, the same way, they get a status update and then when the report is complete, they are also notified. And then they can call anybody in the quality department to find out what the results of that eSafe were. And then the other thing which is coming sometime in the next six months is there will actually be a eSafe app that you can put on your phone which will be simplified and will be much easier for you to do to actually enter an eSafe through that system. So, um, the other thing is that we're going to get into an ACA versus an RCA. But currently, when you think about an RCA, the processes are not that much different than when you do a history and physical. So if you look at, there's a timeline, which is the same as the history, and we go through that timeline, and we're going to walk you through that again today. There's a process map, which is not that much different than a physical exam or a diagnostic test. And then you look at the cause and the effect, which is not that much different than really developing a differential diagnosis and then weeding out what the different cause and effects were and which ones actually led down to and became the root cause analysis. And then there's a casual, casual statement, which is actually the working diagnosis. And then action items are what your plan plan of treatment is. So in this way, when you think about it, just think about the same thing that you do every day when you're working up a patient. Um, so the quality improvement priorities for Erlanger, basically, you're on the front lines, whether you're a nurse or a resident or Sometimes even a fourth year medical student, you're on the front lines. You're the ones who are really providing the care and you're the ones who know what's going on. So you are vital to this overall process. You're also vital to the culture that we have. So this is, these are the corporate objectives, the quality corporate objectives. When the clinical learning environment review happens later this year, there will be uh, reviewers walking around and they will actually come up to you and they may ask you, what are the quality objectives of the Erlanger Health System? And so this runs through what those are. These are the current ones as of December 2019. And <clears throat> what's the hospital experience, so what's patient experience, what are the reportable um, 
hospital acquired events and uh, infections, and that includes Crabsies, Cotties, C. diff, MRSA, and 30-day surgical site infections. And then what's the case mix adjusted length? That's another one of the goals that the system has. And finally, 30-day readmissions. Now this is all on the adult side. You can see that on the children's side and the other campuses, the hospital experience, patient satisfaction, is the same and it's measured across all the different hospitals that our owner has. But the children's hospital has different quality components which include the physician practice and how quickly you can get an appointment there. It also includes all of what we call the SPS, Solutions for Patient Safety and all the harm events that children's has. And then the patient flow is measured through the median ED length of stay for admitted patients. If you go to Bledsoe and uh, Western Carolinas, they measure the median length of stay in minutes for the ED patients that are discharged. So those are just a very quick look at what you know, the quality metrics are for this health system. And this is children's overall scorecard. And again, the major ones are the ones that are starred, the SPS hacks, hospital acquired conditions, physician practices, appointments, total ED turnaround time, and overall satisfaction. So, not every adverse event is a medical error, and not every medical error is an adverse event. So, how do, how do we define and what are we concerned about? We're concerned about preventable harm, harm that should not have happened. And so, how many patients die each year from medical harm? Close. One, one third of all hospitalized patients? Whoa. No, 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 no. I said all, one third of all costs. One third of all costs. Yeah, that, it's around, the estimates are somewhere at least, it may even be more than that because it's around 17 to 20 uh, million dollars, billion dollars, excuse me. So it's, it is a pretty significant number. Um, so the total number of medical errors, this says 250,000, and that was a study out of Hopkins, um, and basic in 2016. But if you look at the numbers over here, that actually breaks this down. You can see that this 12,000 unnecessary surgery, 7,000 medication errors, these are all deaths. 20,000 errors, other errors in the hospital, and 80,000 unnecessary infections. So it's this number that we're really focused on, and that's about 120,000 per year. There are another 106,000 that are non error negative effective drugs, which are still adverse events, but they are not medical errors. And these are the types of medical errors. And one of the ones that's probably been focused on the most in the last few months, a few months, few years, is error or delay in diagnosis. How often do we get the diagnosis wrong? So if a patient comes in with a diagnosis from another institution, how often do we hold on to that diagnosis rather than revising it or changing it? How often? Is huh? 
Not often have we changed it. You'd be surprised. I mean, there are, there's a thing called anchoring bias, which basically says once a diagnosis is given, many times people hold on to it rather than let go of it. And maybe we're a little bit different here because we're an academic training institution, um, and I would hope that's the case. Besides errors in diagnosis, there are also errors in treatment, errors in prevention, and also the other major error is the errors that we have um, in communication. Um, this shows the degree of error. It's a rating system of harm. And we don't worry so much about A, B, because they didn't reach the patient. But once the patient it reaches the patient, even if it didn't cause any harm, that is a significant problem. When you look at errors that are made, um, there was a survey done. One out of 10 doctors said he has been part of a medical error in the last three months. That is a huge number. If you look at the, and do a survey of all patients in the hospital, 21% say they have been, uh, they've had medical errors made on them. So we have a long way to go to get better. But anyway, any error that reaches the patients, the ones we really worry about are obviously the GH and I events. And those are events that may have caused permanent harm, required a code or other intervention to keep that patient alive, or actually contributed to the patient's death. And this just breaks it down in a little different way. Basically, these are the most frequent errors, and they're called mere misses. They never reach the patient. And then you look at those that actually do reach the patient or cause significant harm. Okay. So the final comments I have, and then we're going to turn it over to Jackie to actually walk us through a case, is the biggest thing, though, is what's the culture? What is the culture that is here? Are we a culture that really focuses on teamwork, situational awareness, a culture of safety? And a culture of safety is defined as an environment in which providers can discuss errors, near misses, and harm openly knowing that they won't be unfairly punished and have confidence that reporting safety events will lead to improvement. That's why we have focused so much on making sure you all get input and feedback about events that you have reported. Because if you feel that it just goes into a black box and nobody ever communicates back to you, there's no incentive for you. You don't see the purpose. And so that's why we've really worked very hard to make sure you hear about and know what has happened with that case that you've reported. What do we mean by a just culture? And again, um, in the past, culture, the culture of safety was a culture of reporting people who made mistakes. And it was very much focused on the mistake that the human being made. But we realize that a just culture really focuses on the system and that the system has to be held accountable. And a lot of those errors come from the system not doing what it should be doing. When we take a look at a case, as you'll see, we're going to look at not just what the people who were there, but where was the system? Where did the system fail that patient? And also that we do have zero tolerance for reckless behavior. So while uh, we're all humans, we all make mistakes, the one thing we will not tolerate is reckless behavior where somebody knew that what they were doing was taking a chance with that patient's life. And this just shows some of the things that we look at when we look at system reliability 
and the human factors that are there that we know, what are the barriers to prevent failure, and then recovery to capture failure before they become critical. So if you look at um, each one of the medical errors, we know that there are probably 10 medical errors before that one that finally reached the patient. So there are a lot of errors that build up to and are ignored and that we finally pay attention to after there's some bad outcome. And with that, I will turn it over to Jackie. Good afternoon, everybody. Does everybody have one of the handouts, the white paper? Okay. Um, we have here what we call in our facility, which may not be reflected in a facility that you may go to later in your career, we call it a parent cause analysis versus a root cause analysis. And the parent cause analysis is a limited investigation. It, it identifies immediate things we need to correct. Um, we look at that to see if there's an organizational trend, and they, minimally, they, minimal, they have minimal harm or it's a near miss. Now, near miss events sometimes can be a jewel, as, as uh, some people say, but in this one, I just really consider an apparent cause analysis a mini root cause analysis to see if you need to go into a root cause analysis where you have to do three hour long meetings and sit down with process improvement and bring in so many different people. An ACA has to be done within two to seven days. That's the expectation that's put on my department. Um, a root cause analysis has to be done within 48 hours. And a root cause analysis, again, is events with serious harm or death, multiple apparent cause analysis on the same issue, um, and we review the causal and contributory factors, which, which you'll see what we're going to work on today, and then develop a corrective action plan and monitoring and sustaining the change. Oops. Okay, so let's, I'm going to go through this. We're kind of running short on time, but the issue is in this case study that is hypothetical is that a patient received 36 milligrams of Ativan on hospital day five, and they added a Presidex drip, and the patient had the scheduled Librian doses throughout their stay. Seven hours after the Presidex drip was started, the patient had to be intubated. So we have a 52-year-old male came into the hospital with respiratory failure. He was recently discharged from a North Georgia hospital approximately 24 hours earlier. He was in the hospital there for DTs in withdrawal. He spent uh, six days in the ICU. He has chronic alcoholism, cirrhosis, and when he left the hospital there, he was to continue his um, Ativan, one milligram by mouth, as needed during the day. So we don't know if he went home and then started drinking again, but he showed back up to um, our hospital, per this piece of paper, <laughs> and uh, with respiratory failure and pneumonia. So they admitted him. He was going to, uh, he arrived to the ED and the sepsis workup was initiated. Uh, he was not agitated during those first few hours on the day of arrival. On hospital day one, he was uh, still in the ED. He was disoriented, and the plan was to admit him to the floor. On hospital day two, he started getting more and more agitated, and uh, they changed into an ICU admission. Remember, he's still on an ED hold, and he had three doses of Librium, but no Ativan was given on hospital day one. On hospital day two, he had only five milligrams of Ativan, and he was given all of his doses of Librium. Um, around 4.30 p.m. on hospital day two, he was moved to the ICU. The nurse there, um, what we call the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment for Alcohol. Is everybody uh, familiar with the CEWA protocol? Okay. And they went ahead and gave him a score of 28, but at this time he was not on that protocol. On hospital day three, um, the ICU nurse about 10 o'clock in the morning started noticing the patient was fighting restraints, uh, pulling at cords, yelling and cussing, and disoriented. Um, so finally somebody spoke up and said, we need to get to see what protocol, because the Ativan is only ordered one milligram every four hours. So during that day, he had the protocol started, and he got 21 milligrams over 24 hours, and he did continue to get his Librium three times during that day. Um, as you notice, on hospital day, scores, day four, we have no SEWA scores. 
So the ICU nurse um, around 4.30, I mean 2.30 in the afternoon uh, noted that the patient was still trying to get out of bed, had four milligrams of Ativan, so they had to get some GIA done, IM, and then approximately <clears throat> uh, maybe 30 to 40 minutes later, he got drowsy, started having respiratory problems, the SATs dropped, uh, they had to increase his oxygen, and then, um, and then a, a couple hours later the patient continued to have problems, so they did ABGs. Um, they increased the, the oxygen again, and then he was monitored and there were no further issues. During that time of respiratory distress, he had 16 milligrams of Ativan and two, milligram, two doses of his 10 milligram Librium because he was too drowsy to take the others. So he's just all over the place. He's up and down. Uh, hospital day five, let me start out hospital day five, he got a total of 36 milligrams of Ativan and the Presidex strip. So this is a day, another day in question. Um, they started the SEWA scores that morning. I don't know if a new nurse came on that knew better or what. But we'll go on to the next page. And he had increasing agitation from about 3.30 in the morning all the way to 9, and he kept getting out of van frequently. So the hospital was surrounded around 9 o'clock, uh, documented the patient is stable, sitting up in bed, eyes partially open with minimal response to verbal stimuli, um, nose documenting there was increased O2 requirements the day before, and a Presidex strip was ordered at that time to titrate to the RAS. So the goal of the Presidex strip is to have uh, a RAS score of zero to minus two. So that's alert and calm to drowsy to light sedation. So the Presidex strip did not get started until, let's see, um, almost three o'clock. And um, at three o'clock the RAS score was one. Um, at um, 10 to 4, it was eight, the SEWA score was 18, gave another 4 milligrams of Ativan. Um, at 16.03, they increased the precedent strip. The patient was restless at 1 plus. And then from 4 to 4.38, the patient's SEWA score decreased to 4 from 12. And then at 19.20, we've got a moderate sedation level on our RAS score of minus 3. And again, at 2100, he's still a minus three, and there's no changes in the Presidex strip. So from there on out, I won't go through everything, but he just got worse and worse. A rapid was called, and he was intubated. So that is your case study. Any questions that I could clarify on that? Okay. So Paul's going to talk about um, the process map that once we go through this timeline that we develop. Thank you, Jackie. So ultimately what we want to do is to get to what are the root cause or causes of the event uh, and then come up with actions that will mitigate the risk of that event happening again in the future. So as we, there's a process we walk through to get to that. Um, first, we create a high-level process map, um, and this is just a high-level representation of the event. And a team can do this quickly by putting stickies or post-its on the wall. And if you look around, we've actually created uh, one for you in the interest of time. So the flow of that is quite simple, you know, left to right, process step one, step two, step three, and so on. Uh, and as I mentioned, we, we put this one together since we're kind of compressed for time. So I'll run through this quickly. So patient was in the ECD, admission order was written, uh, patient transferred to the ICU, CWA protocol initiated, Presidex ordered, rapid response initiated, patient was transferred to BEH, and then patient in the MICU. Um, once we have that process map created, what we want to do is to brainstorm for what are really the causes, potential causes, that may have uh, contributed to the outcome, and then we put those underneath the corresponding process step. So the, uh, when we're done doing the, the cause exercise, you know, it looks something like this where you have these potential causes lining up under the step associated uh, in the event. So we're going to do that as an exercise in just a few minutes, but before, 
uh, we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about the cause and effect diagram. How many of you have done a fishbone? Quite a few of you. Very good. Um, cause and effect diagram is sometimes referred to as a fishbone for obvious reasons, right? Kind of looks like a fish. We have the effect at the front, and then the bones have cause categories on them. So um, a standard set of cause categories that you can use, and you don't have to stick to these. Um, you can change them. Uh, but one that we're, we're using here um, in a healthcare setting is leadership or culture, equipment, environment, procedures, people, and communication. So to give you a little bit of context on some of those, I'm going to use an example here of just an unexpected infant illness, right? And we're going to blow this up a little bit. So under leadership culture, we might say uh, all the birth team not in attendance for delivery, equipment, delay in getting lab uh, results from the analyzer, environment, poor lighting uh, in the central sterile assembly area, procedures, specimen was labeled with the wrong patient sticker, uh, people, assessment not documented, and communication didn't receive information regarding the mother's uh, medication allergy. So those are just high-level causes. I mentioned earlier what we really want to do is get to what is the root cause of something. A technique we use in that is referred to as the five whys, which is basically just asking why over and over until we get to what is essentially the root cause, or in other words, asking why further just doesn't make sense. You've kind of come down to that distilled reason. So I'll, I'll walk through, in the interest of time, just one example here. Uh, so and you're going to participate in this. When I read the uh, cause, everybody's going to say, why? OK? So under leadership culture, uh, all of the birth team not in attendance for delivery. Why? Right. Well, the pager system doesn't deliver 100% of the pages. The outdated paging equipment has not been upgraded. Because when considering all capital requests for the system, this issue, this issue has a lower priority. So you can see how you keep asking why until you really get to what is the root cause uh, of an issue. I'm going to skip through some of those. All right. So we're here ready to start our breakout exercise. Um, I'm going to assign folks numbers. We're just going to go around and I did a head count with the number we have an eight. We should have about five, six people per team. Um, and when we start, you'll have three minutes to write on the stickies. And uh, located in the bags at each station, you'll have uh, Sharpies uh, and some Post-it notes or stickies. Uh, and we want you to put those causes underneath what you think uh, really aligns to that in the process step. So I'm going to start over here. And we'll just go around counting one through eight and then repeat. So, you know what your number is? Um, move to the section that is associated with your number. Get your Sharpie, uh, Sharpies and your um, Post-its out of there. And then I'm going to set up a timer on my phone. And when we say go, you'll have three, min three minutes to write potential causes.
Okay, and if, if you are just coming in, just pick a group. Um, we're going through a brainstorming exercise here where we are looking for potential causes associated with the outcome of our event. All right, looks like everyone is situated. Ready and go. Uh, well, so uh, your goal right now is to align your causes underneath the uh, process steps. But you know, I think in the interest of time, let's go ahead and align those directly to the fishbone. Normally in this process, you would put these underneath the high level process map. Uh, and then when that exercise is done, you would move those over to the corresponding category on the fishbone. Um, but uh, we'll go ahead and just put them directly onto the fishbone. That'll give you a little bit more time as well to brainstorm. So if you're asking why for a, a cause and you're drilling down, you can offset your post it kind of like it is up here on the screen to indicate that is something that is a, uh, you're, you're drilling down to what a root cause is. So we'll take an additional three minutes since we're um, skipping to the fishbone exercise. So continue on. So about one more minute and then uh, we'll ask some of the groups to report out on um, what one of their root causes is. 
and we'll just go around the room and hear from the various groups. All right, let's go ahead and um, start with our report out. Okay, so we got to get moving along here. We're going to start with group one. What we would like you to do is to pick uh, just, you can have more than one root cause, but just pick one root cause. Start with the cause category, and if it's a drill down, tell us, you know, your causes that got you down to the root cause. Okay. Don't be shy. What was the question? So tell us what one of your root causes are that you determine and start with the cause category. And if you did a drill down, tell us the causes that got to that root, root cause. Okay, everybody, listen up. We're going to walk through where each one of the groups is with at least one of their root causes. So group one. So we had a root cause under leadership and culture. We had a delay in the CWA initiation. Um, and we think that the why could have been a failure to recognize the necessity for a CWA protocol as opposed to just a PRN at a van order. The why? The, the, the why is they failed to recognize the need for a CWA protocol as opposed to. So did the physician know about the protocol? Or exactly. I think right. the education, right. why would you do it, how to do it, that kind of thing. Okay. So I tell you what we might, well, we'll come back to that in just a second. Let's move on to another group. And if you have a uh, different root cause, uh, uh, choose the different one. All right, so one of the uh, one of the things that we saw was under people and saw that the CY, even after it was ordered, it was actually not followed. And, um, and we were kind of trying to bring some why that might have been. It might have been because uh, he was already placed on, um, or he was having decreased mental status. Um, so they chose to, I guess, go with PRNs and even the, the scale it up to the Presidex strip. Um, and then that might have been due to, um, to staffing issues uh, with the nursing or the physicians uh, as well. Okay. Thank you. Next group. Uh, so one thing we talked about was um, how there appeared to be no medication review. We put that on the procedures. Um, and so I don't know if we know why, but, you know, there should have been, you know, physician reviewing it, nursing reviewing it, and pharmacy usually reviews it as well. So he was on essentially three benzos at one point, and somehow that never got reviewed. Thank you. Next group. And if you, if you don't have one that's different, it's okay to skip. Um, so we kind of talked about uh, patient monitoring in the um, unit or wherever else he was. Primarily the issue was whether or not he was appropriately being scored with the CWA, um, as well as trying to figure out, you know, what are his vitals and appropriately addressing his vitals and the reasons for his agitation. So um, instead of, like, just focusing on the, okay, it's alcohol, it's alcohol, it's alcohol what else is going on. Okay, thank you.
Yeah, if you have a, a different root cause that hasn't been mentioned, select that one. Uh, but if you don't, it's okay to skip. We'll move on to the next group. So we, we have, I think, under people, uh, because um, Siwa, he was like scored 20 on day five, and Presidex was ordered, but it would, didn't get started till three o'clock. But he also had decrease of Siwa from 20 to 10. And he received four milliliters of Ativan. But he still started on the pressure strip. And then two hours later, not even two hours later, CYA again was, was calculated, Ativan was given, did not check CYA appropriately again. They checked it too soon, and they increased the pressure strip. So there's like a lot going on. It just you should check every two hours. But they obviously didn't over here. But okay. they increase the process strip as well. All right. Thank you. All right, group six. They, they say they don't really have a different root cause. Okay. Group seven, do you have anything that was de identified as a different root cause? Okay. How about, how about group eight? I'll wait till we get you a microphone. We have a few things, but one thing that we can touch on is that the Presidex strip is titrated to a RAS score and not a CWA score, whereas the Ativan is to the CWA score. So a CWA score of zero is very different from a RAS of negative two. So that's one issue. And then another thing that we said may be that the nurse didn't feel empowered when he first was admitted to the ICU to say, hey, we need a CWA, even though she documented it. It wasn't discussed with the physician until the next day. So may, we put that kind of like culture of not feeling that they were able to express. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So coming up, we got a lightning round here. All right. We're only going to take a minute, but what I would like for you to do, just so you understand kind of the process here, the, the root cause that you reported out on, um, and if you skip, just pick one of your root causes. I want you to think of what is an action item that you could do to address that particular root cause. All right. So we're going to take one minute and go. You probably should say that. Overall, I will, but we can think first. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's what the medicine residency does. But the okay. other place, it's up to the physician's discretion. 15 seconds. Yeah, and we may, may just pick a few. Yeah, let's just. All right, time is up, uh, and in the interest of time, uh, we won't be able to go through everyone. But uh, let's pick. Let's hear from Group Four. So, Group Four, what did you determine as a uh, action item to address one of your root causes? Uh, one of the action items would be to um, review the education of uh, nurses with regard to the application of the CEWA protocol, make sure that they understand both CEWA and RAS, make sure that they understand what is required for um, uh, what, what is being calculated, how it's being calculated, when it should be calculated, and then how that uh, resulting score should be used to adjust the medications that are being given to the patient. So drill down is the patient edu or the nurse education with regard to these protocols. Okay, thank you. And let's do let's do group eight over here. What is one of your action items? Um, so there are a couple things we talked about, but with uh, the concern about nurses feeling empowered for it, 
uh, encouraging multi multidisciplinary rounds. So that way, nurses can bring up those concerns if they just have, you know, if they're calculating CWAS scores in the 20s and they're not getting orders for it. Um, be a concern there. And then talking about the Presidex strip, changing the goal, there's no reason to have the goal be the same as it is for intubated patients with these patients. There's no reason for RAS of negative two. RAS of zero is very reasonable if that's why we're using Presidex. All right, thank you very much. You can return back to your seats. Jackie, while they're walking back to their seats, do you want to give them um, one of the things that you came up with as far as? Well, for our CEWA protocol, it's up to the physician discretion on what to do when a patient comes in when they've got a history of high alcohol use or some kind of uh, dependence on a substance. And we have no standardization in our hospital, so if somebody came in, why not go ahead and just in ordered the CEWA protocol to be there if needed, and then we wouldn't have all this guesswork on when to start it and when it's appropriate. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> uh, also, this, um, there's an education factor here. In this area where they have these patients, they don't do it all the time. So they didn't really know what they were doing and they weren't well educated on it. So you, you guys hit on everything that we would have come up with this, for this hypothetical patient. So one final point that I want to touch on is just what's the strength of an intervention? So many of you mentioned uh, education. Uh, what's the strength of an educational effort? You can read it, right? <coughs> Training and education is a weak educational uh, effect when you look at the impact. Now, we all believe in education, but we all tie it to your practical experience and what you do every day. So just having somebody do um, another educational computer programmed uh, subject around alcohol is that really going to change people's behavior or make them pay attention to what they should be paying attention to? So education is weak. Studying things more and doing more analysis is weak. <clears throat> now, we know that checklists do make a difference. And the more you can standardize things, the better the effect. So checklists, obviously somebody mentioned staffing. And if staffing and workload are not appropriate and people are covering too many patients, that is a huge issue. Um, and then improving communication. Uh, I think you, group eight talked about communication at one point. So really, how do you do that? And do you have a standard mechanism? How many people in here use iPass for their handoff? Okay. Having a standardized mechanism is very helpful. Software enhancement. Is there a way we can work with Epic to make sure that those protocols are in there and come up every time? Um, and then even stronger ones, uh, actually having your leadership engaged in patient safety, simplifying processes, and then standardizing the process of a care map. So, um, as Jackie has mentioned, some of the uh, programs, internal medicine, I think, uses the CWA protocol all, on all patients who come in who have any history of alcohol. Is that, co is that correct? So the question is whether that becomes a standardized protocol. The more standardized it is, the more you use it, the better effect it has. So very quickly, healthcare is a complex system, very complex. Uh, errors occur, we're all humans, we're all gonna make errors, and then there are also system errors. But who develops the systems? Humans. So we build errors into the system sometimes. 
And we're also, we're all moving and trying to get to zero harm for the patient. That's the goal. Um, and then I just again want. So, again, now we, I apologize, that was very quick, uh, but just to give you some feeling for the processes that you go through, and remember to use your process map, break down what happened, and then go ahead and use your fishbone to figure out, okay, what area, what do we need to address, and where does it fit? Um, so with that, thank you all for your attention, and um, have a great day.